Gareth and Dahl, the warning in the great miracle, the divine reset that will correct the conscience of the world. It's a book of great hope. I can't wait to get my hands on it, uh, especially because like Ted said, it's about putting the facts out there and for us to discern. How can our viewers, how can uh, th those who are watching this find your book and get a copy of it? It's on sign.org and it's actually right now uh, greatly reduced and um, it's right on the home page now. Fantastic. The whole world is sick. Are you worried about America? I am. Believe the impossible and you can do the incredible. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Catholic Patriot and getting ready to transition more specifically into some of the the, the pivotal prophetic elements of Garabandal. Is there anything else historically or, or in the, or I should say, the, the story of the major parts of the messages that we haven't covered before we get into what we've alluded to already, this worldwide warning? Um, a, a a miracle that will take place, and then a, a permanent sign that will be left. Is there anything that we're missing before we transition into that? Another one is Russia would suddenly and unexpectedly overrun a great part of the free world. It will be at a time when the world, the warning will be at a time when the world is most in need of it. So there's the phrase, Russia will suddenly and unexpectedly. Now with the war in Ukraine, I found it interesting. I saw a uh, a story just the other day, because I've been following that the Ukraine since the very, very beginning, because mm -hmm. Maliki Martin had done an introduction. For just about to mention him. <laughs> in, in, in 1993. And yeah. Maliki yeah. Martin had always told me he came down to visit once. I had been in his apartment twice, mm. you know, for these three, three and a half hour lunches type things. And he said, never take your eyes off Ukraine. And, you know, he, he, he didn't say it was a part of the third secret of Fatima or anything else, but he said, never take your eyes off Ukraine. And so um, I saw a story just the other day where a Russian general uh, said, listen, we could get in Poland in all of about six minutes. And, you know, is this really a world war that's going on? The answer is yes, this is a world war. We've got 30 NATO nations, we have China, we have a lot of Middle Eastern nations. We have Iran uh, helping um, with intelligence, armaments, and equipment, munitions. They're helping Russia. Um, we're helping. The, um, the, the West is actually helping the Ukraine. So if this isn't a world war, what is it? I mean, the, the Vietnam War by government was called a conflict. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting place that we are like even as we're having this podcast there is the i think there's a huge bait baiting going on to try to get poland to get into the into this whole war against russia which would be a disaster and i think that they're being completely used by global globalist powers we can talk a little bit about that because you've mentioned the whole thing this is a divine reset this is the you know uh, up against the parody of that which is what they're calling the great reset um, and you have to understand so many of the different deeper levels, I mean, and, and even the deepest levels of who is really controlling what, because sovereign nations mean nothing to those of, of a Luciferian global order. They'll use anybody from whatever side they can, as long as in the end they get what they want and the destruction of cultures and civilizations. Um, and it's interesting too, I, I don't want to go off on this, I almost did, but um, just a comment as you're talking about these things of Garabandal 
And of course, these are things that were 60 years ago. And what about things that have happened since then? More particularly, let's say, under the pontificate of John Paul II, his consecration in 1984, and what had happened soon, you know, soon after that, with the beginning of the collapse of uh, of the Soviet Union, um, and things that were averted. You know, sometimes we we might not ever really know the power of the of the prayers that we've had to mitigate certain things or even avert certain things. Um, how have you handled that element when you're looking at the data, or maybe? It's just, like you said, maybe it's just a, a complete data dump that's relevant to that period and let our minds 60 years later try to put the pieces together and how they have related to other apparitions, other pontiffs, and things that have major ecclesial acts that m may have, and to some degree, brought or averted some of the, the seriousness of these chastisements. Or is it is it clearly too late, we're going to experience in some fashion fire from the sky at this point. I know it's that if then. But. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you've just, you, you know, you've put literally a PhD thesis of what could be a book on the things you've addressed. <laughs> I mean, if you look at NATO, NATO with 30 nations, we've got Finland now. Finland has an 800 mile border with Russia. Mm -hmm. 800 miles. That's from my house to Chicago on the east, in Virginia to Chicago. That's a very, very long way. And so the Blessed Mother said to Conchita, it would be like an invasion of communism. The girls described the times of the tribulation as the return of communism. So something happens. Mm -hmm. Now, how did I deal with the issue of, of where Russia, Ukraine... I put most of the stuff on the trip uh, on on Ukraine with a pope going to, a pope going to Moscow. I give the complete history of Francis on that, literally meeting uh, Patriarch Kirill all the way back in Havana, Cuba for the first time in an airport meeting, and them talking. And then um, so there's a lot on Russia, but on the issue, uh, I ask an incredibly fundamental question now. The issue of consecration, as I say in the book, is still a red hot issue among really good people and people of goodwill. But I ask the most fundamental question of all: if the if the consec if the consecration was done specifically as asked by the Blessed Mother, Russia by name alone, would we have the war we have now? Now, do I think there was something done that was very, very beneficial for the world and very efficacious for all mankind with any time anything's been mentioned with a consecration of Ukraine or Russia or Russia in 1984? Um, yeah, I think, you know, and we saw the birth. Now, I had an office in, in, in an apartment in Warsaw, Poland. Um, January 1st, 1990. So I saw it kind of up close and personal. And I was in Belarus for two years after that. So, you know, I saw what the Soviet Union was pretty clearly then and in what communism had done. But you mentioned something about, you know, Europe. In Article 85 of NATO, if one country is invaded under the Constitution or whatever it's called inside NATO, all other countries have to come to its defense. So mm -hmm. if, if, if Poland moves or if Russia moves against a country, now Poland has a great history of saints with, you know, Faustina, Maximilian Kolbe, right. John Paul II, yeah. some, but J Poland just has lousy geography. I mean, there's march, there's armies of Germany and Russia marching across that country every 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, yeah. it's a tough, it's a tough spot. But communism, there is something that happens in the world of what could be immediate. I don't know what exactly what it would be. I think mankind runs on economics. At the very heart is the love of money, of man that will cause something. Due to the interconnectivity of the world economy, you can see something happening in one world capital that will have an impact on another world capital. Why? Because what's happening in Beijing, Moscow, mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., Riyadh, today, Yemen, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, with the Houthis, where, where UK and the United States getting involved in that as of yesterday. So, you know, anything can happen very, very quickly. Yeah. And could it could it go nuclear? I don't know. You know, but it appears that uh, the return of communism is a major, major message coming from Garabandal. And as I say, the United States has incrementally, through socialism, gone communist. I don't call it socialism in the United States anymore. We've actually gone communist. If you yeah. were to sit back and really vis-a-vis -vis scripture of what the United States was in the 30s, 40s, 50s, which wasn't perfect, never has been, never will be, but we never had such heinous laws. And we, we saw recently what was happening with the FBI literally going after and monitoring conservative. It was TLM masses. They did mm -hmm. in Richmond as well as Oregon and other places that we know of yeah. and where it was done that we don't know of. So we can see the gradual encroachment of rights that is moving us to communism slash a world without God in a country without yeah. God. So, Ted, in our first uh, part of our conversation, we, we focus a lot on the history of the why behind Garabandal, you know, why the 1960s, what was the significance of that in a changing world, and all the things that would really come to fruition 60 years later. We were talking about the war that's going on in Ukraine, but it's really, we are in a world war, and Ukraine is a very significant place um, in the midst of all that, we, you know, we're not going to jump into all of the speculations of that as well, but it is significant, but we have war now you know, in the Middle East, we've got genocide going on, we, uh, just various places, um, and then of course all the things of the, the, the division of the church, and just there's just war on every level. But it's interesting though, when I was um, doing just some research and then looking at points that you had mentioned as well, it reminded me I had heard somewhere that Conchita, one of the visionaries, had mentioned that there would not be a third world war. Can you, as a lead into the prophecies that we'll, that we'll be talking about, give us an idea of where that came from and is that accurate? Well, yeah, I think the words how it came about and why. Um, and um, it's been a point of contention among, again, the, these are people really of goodwill with differences of opinion. But, um, I mean, what, what, when it was said was October of 1962, when Khrushchev was motoring, you know, towards Cuba. And, you know, every, uh, bunkers were being built in the United States for, to, to handle a nuclear explosion. Homes were being built with bunkers. Children in schools were literally going under their, uh, under their desk, to, putting their hands over the back of their neck, you know, and head uh, on their knees under their desk for, for such a thing. So she was asked that, would there be a third world war? The answer is... When she was asked that, that's when Khrushchev and Kennedy was a very, very tense thing. And a great deal of the world thought that that could turn into a war. The context when that question was asked was the timing specifically of um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay. So, right. but, but does it mean something else? Again, I present the data. And it, mm -hmm. it could it have meant something else? But in my opinion, we have a third world war right now that um, is, is going on in, in, in Ukraine and Russia. And don't forget, Russia has there's they've got 11 time zones. That's from my house to Perth, Australia, <laughs> all the way across the United States, all the way across the Pacific Ocean. And then from Sydney to Perth, that's mm -hmm. a very, very long way for one country you know, with the Republic, with Russia from Vladivostok to St. Petersburg. So, uh, but, but the context, in my personal opinion, had to do specifically with the Cuban Missile Crisis. But there are people who think that it meant perpetuity. I'm just not one of them. Well, yeah, I, I think the context is important. But I also think you don't even need prophecy or anything like that to just look at what's going on right now and to see the truth of the very fact that we are in a global world. We are in a World War III. It's just in different phases of it. And not only that, you have consistent messages saying, including Garibandal and Akita Japan, 
fire falling from the sky. So regardless of, I mean, that points that whether it's from heaven, from something from the heavens, directly from God, or if it's referring to some uh, nuclear exchange that takes place, um, which may very, very well happen, and maybe that could be what precipitates also the warning. When it, I mean, that would certainly be a sign that all help or all hope seems to be lost if that happens. Um, you know, it's like, does it matter in that sense? Because it's it's uh, we're in the most serious times, and then of course you have other Catholic mystics, uh, whether it be um, Anne Catherine Emmerich or Blessed uh, Elena Vallejo, who who have similar things of you know Russia working its way through. And I, like I said, I think a lot of those things can be misunderstood um, in the sense of, you know, like Russia just being this constant aggressor. I think in, um, I have a different p opinion. Maybe you don't, you don't agree with it, but I, I just think that um, Russia will be the first to convert. And I had something I'd like to talk about that because I remember, I think it was it's things that I was reading that you have uh, mentioned in regards to Garibandal that there is some kind of connection between Russia's conversion and the warning. So why don't we just use that as a springboard and get into, and you can choose, but there seems to be a, a clear chronology that the children have been told, or maybe you can do, you can correct me which ones have been told, that there's going to be this really uh, some acts of great mercy and, and the last call for the whole world to, to turn back to God through what is now, be, you know, it's called the warning, or in Spanish, aviso, um, followed by a then a, a miracle, and then a permanent sign. All three of these are worldwide in nature. And so where would you like to start with that? Well, you're really right now dealing with the sizzle and the fat and the fire. As it concerns specifically Garabandal, it's probably these two things that it's most known for. There's uh, what Garabandal is about, why, why, it's actually quite simple. It's actually a great act of mercy to where mankind that has lost any resemblance to goodness is actually so far off course right now. It's going to be a divine reset, bigger than the great reset of man, to reverse the conscience of the world. Now, we're told also the miracle will be for the conversion of Russia, and that, but for the conversion of the whole world as well. And thus, all will love our hearts, the Blessed Mother said. All will love our hearts, the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart. We're in new territory the world has never seen. And we're at a point right now that this is about mercy and hope. That's that's what Garabandal. That's the why. Where great, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And it, 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 heaven is meeting the evil on its own terms. Frankly, like the Jews leaving Egypt with the parting of the Red Sea. And the parting of the Red Sea was a very localized event for just you know people there. Then there's been no event in all of mankind that has been prophesied in advance to for every single person in the world to ex expect this warning. So if we want to unpack this warning and the miracle, which is where the real meat of, of people who are interested in Garabandal go to, there's a lot of data on it. There's less on the warning. The only person who knew the year of the warning but was not going to make an announcement was Mary Lowley, and she died. Mary Lowley Mazan, who became Mary Lowley Lafleur when she lived in Haverhill, Massachusetts, right on the border of New Hampshire, and um, but and she never it, it wasn't going to be a public announcement where she would say anything in advance, and so we we know it, it has different names, the aviso in Spanish. Uh, some people put it into the category of a near-death experience. I think it's much more profound. I've talked to as many as 25 or 30 people in the last 40 years that have experienced something like it. And I even did a film on it where I put several people. And one was a person by the name of Dick Bingold, who became quite well known as a healer. Dick had, if anybody ever saw the movie The French Connection, 
mm. with Popeye Doyle, who is Gene Hackman. He was his partner in New York City, and then he went down to drug enforcement agency in Miami. And then he lived the boating culture and drinking and all sorts of other things he shouldn't have been doing. He exp he was about six feet five, probably about 280. He was a monstrous guy, very big barrel chested guy. And he had um, not treated his wife well, and as well as his child, his son. And when he experienced the warning, he actually fell to his kitchen room floor. This is his testimony, public testimony. He fell to his kitchen room floor and couldn't get off the floor for five hours weeping mm. as he saw his whole life go before him. So this correction of the conscience or the illumination of conscience, a judgment in miniature, it has different names that are interchangeable that really mean the exact same thing. And every single person that has experienced the warning, which is a gift of grace, I've actually for many years prayed to receive it. I would like to receive it and it hasn't been granted. And uh, I would just like to receive it, frankly, ahead of time, <laughs> you know, get it over with. But um, to the, but uh, <clears throat> Conchita and the kids say to the degree of sanctification, and fidelity to to the sacraments and to the church and everything else and to living a good life, the less the severity of the event will be. And the day of the warning is not a day of death. It's a day of where you will see your life. And think of a person as they flip through their 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 cell phone looking at pictures and they just go from one to one to one. It's been described like that and where there is actually serious sin, it goes much slower. And it apparently it doesn't last that long, but it seems much, much longer. And then there's the aftermath of it. But as I say, the people who have experienced the warning that I've spoken to and read about and interviewed, et cetera, it, they say it's the absolute, the single biggest event in your life that you can ever, ever imagine. And Dick Bingold, for one, after he experienced it, became a missionary to South Africa mm -hmm. after being in, in different positions in government and drug and, and law enforcement. That's very, very common. Will people all have the exact same response? Probably not, depending on how hard their hearts are. But it's a grace. It has to be viewed as a grace of mercy and thus bring hope. So then um, well, I could go on and on about that, but um, it's going to have it's going to change the world is what it's going to do. Satan's Satan will will know that people know that he doesn't have that kind of authority over them that they used to have that they experienced before. And so then within what now we get into where there's much more data points from what came out. There's actually more than a dozen of them within one year. Now I'm sticking to Garabandal only within one year will be a great miracle. Hey, Tad, and, before that, you means jump. It could, that means yep. it could be no more than nine days if you want to look at the eight days in advance of where it would be, mm -hmm. all the way up to 365 days. Within is the operative word legally. Okay. I, I just had a quick interjection just before we go into the into the miracle. Um, some things that I had read about it um, is that one of the profound uh, parts of the warning why it will be so transformative is because it won't only be the seeing of your your sins but you will experience them as the sin is from the perspective of god not just from what our memory will spark as something that will you know obviously elicit emotions and things but because there's, when we examine our own conscience, there's still some level of imperfection, you can say. Even though we talked about we want to always have a make an, an act of perfect contrition, which is a lot harder than people might realize. But in the warning, you will truly understand from God's view the, the effects of your sin. Like You'll experience those things. 
Uh, and that's why it will be something that will be very painful no matter what, because um, there's no way around it. There's no filter through your own ego of whatever it is that will get you through it. Because some people might think like, well, I confess these things and and that's good, but it'd be very different. This is this is God without the filters allowing you to to literally experience the effects of your own sins. Otherwise, you would, you would might you might wonder well, what's the difference between that and just a really good examination of conscience by seeing things. So, well, that's a that's a major part. We will, uh, you know, if we said something to hurt or an action harmed or something like that, we're going to see that in the impact that it had on a person's life. We're going to see the sins of omission and commission, which is really what you're talking about. It's yeah. on a much, much broader the broader scale than we think. And the people who have experienced it, there's one story in particular that I read of a person who experienced the warning. That person couldn't put down on paper what they experienced for five years. Hmm. They couldn't tell their spouse of, of what they experienced during the life review because the person had no words for it. And the woman who experienced that I'm aware of said she, she couldn't put it on paper for five years. And the woman's a doctor. She couldn't mm. put it. She, she didn't know how to write it. She, she had no framework of what happened uh, in, in during that brief amount of time. Is there any, this is the question that I've wondered, does the warning pertain to sins already forgiven let's say you really did have a perfect contrition for you know certain sins and when you're absolved or for example i thought even more specifically the the graces the the unique graces of of divine mercy sunday which is like like a second baptism kind Absolutely. of a thing does That's god right. take you back before that if really the you can say the delete button and your disposition of soul really did receive what he gave, what he wants to give us on that day, so that there's another purpose for it, or is it get your soul prepared through these kinds of graces so that it won't you because you won't then see those things? Is there any commentary on that from anybody who's experienced it? Or um, it's funny you say that. I mean, Peter, you're really showing your background here as a PhD in theology and aware of divine mercy. But I asked Father Seraphim Mekalenko that in my own house many, many years ago. Um, he was very aware of this kind of stuff. He believed in it. He, you know, he, he's, he, he was the vice postulator of the cause of, of St. Faustina. And his SM is actually even mentioned in the diary, mm. if people don't know that. SM is mentioned even in the diary. And that's him, that he would be late to the canonization, which he was. And um, I asked him that, and he said, once in, in, in light of the divine mercy stuff with confession and a desire to change, but not actually holding sin and with, with the amendment, he said it's forgiven. So, in, you know, without having any more insight on that, I believe once a person has confessed it, and especially the divine mercy promise, which is frankly something like, in my opinion, the, the covenant that God made with Abraham. That promise is so great that God made to literally Faustina. It's, it's, it, for me, it's on the same parallel of, of, of yeah. a covenant that God made with Abraham. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. major. It's a major gift to humanity. So will it have been seen? Maybe once it's confessed, is it forgiven? Yes. And that's why people who have experienced some really serious sin in their life, if they, if I, I've always advised them to go into the divine mercy mode and you can start out, you know, as sins be as scarlet, they become white as snow, which Faustina is actually quoting Isaiah 1, which mm. is where that is. You know, and it's the exact same quote from Isaiah. So your sins as scarlet become white as snow. So that I'll, I'll just rest on scripture that it's you may see it, but you, the judgment is over for it. And that's the grace of heaven through right. divine mercy, which is what the warning and the miracle in Garabandal is all about. In a word, mercy, bringing hope through trust. Mm -hmm which is why people feel encouraged with the message after they read it, that frankly, God has a plan 
and and the divine intervention of these promises said so much in advance uh, it's going to come to fruition. Now Conchita at the moment, I probably shouldn't say Conchita's age, but she's 75 <laughs> next month. Um, so, you know, we're going to know shortly. I don't think she'll, she'd be an odd person if she lives forever. You know, so, uh, are we Unless getting we make it to the era of peace? Who knows what, what will happen then? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> <But> I, <laughs> it, it's like there was a, it's like there was a mosaic covenant and there was the time of, of the 631 laws that nobody could live. And then Jesus came and there was the redemptive era. So it went from one era to another. It's not the end of the world, as a lot of people would like to, whether he's skeptical right. or really hardened on it. We're just moving into another era. Or as the Blessed Mother calls, new times, a new Jerusalem, an era of peace and that kind of language. We're moving into a new dimension in the world, mm -hmm. a, a, a new era through these kind of events that are on the horizon. Not just yet, but where you can see the light now. Absolutely. And and, and sorry, I, I interrupted only that because you were mentioning Conchita's age because that's something about that she was, she said that she will be alive when these things take place and so as is that the only thing we really know about the warning other than it'll come at a time when the world seems like there's no hope less or hope hope left and well, and the fact that conchita will be alive are those like the only two um clues as far as that of, of a time span um no i think there's more um where you can piece things together um, just through circumstances in the world and what was said. Conchita said, or Mary Lowley said, the, the warning would happen when the world is most in need of it. Mm -hmm. The Blessed Mother said to Father Gobi, who I do quote in the book, um, that write its message 25G, uh, if anybody's got the blue book, right when it appears Satan um, takes control the in a trice, heaven will intervene. Right when it appears Satan is in control, heaven will intervene in a trice. And I thought, of, first time I read that 30 years ago, I thought it was a misprint with the word thrice somehow, because I had never known what the word trice meant. It means in an instant or quickly. So right when it appears <laughs> Satan is the victor, heaven will intervene. And then, and, and again, uh, yeah. Russia is central to these messages. Russia was central, not, not the China, not the Persian Gulf, not Ukraine, mm -hmm. not, not anything to do with the Muslims or anything else or Islam. The central message is about Russia converting. Mm -hmm. and Which that, is a hopeful message. That's a majorly hopeful message that I think a lot of people can't quite comprehend because they also have... I think some mis uh, some serious misunderstandings about the history of Russia and things. And I mean, Fulton Sheen was very optimistic about Russia, you know, saying salvation will come from the East. St. Maximilian Kolbe saw the, a statue of the Immaculata going down the streets into Moscow. And Russia is the only country that I know of in the prophecy, uh, maybe, and maybe modern prophecy, that has been said will convert when the rest of us talking about like apostasy and will there be any faith left like in Europe and all these places. So there's something, there's a hopeful thing about Russia and it's Chris, deeply Christian roots that I, I think it's important for people to hold on to. And, and Ted, you can comment on this because um, Russia, when I think it was something I was reading from you was talking about the warning is, is very particular to Russia because Will, will the warning be the beginning of a very clear, explicit conversion of Russia that will be seen, not just speculated? It'll be like, like it'll it'll physically turn for their their for their country and the tide of other events. Well, without getting into speculation, although I have a lot of personal opinions, but that's not what I put out and talk about other than, frankly, in my dining room table or with friends. And they're, they're very, very, very profound. Um, but we know Russia is central 
it was at Fatima and is here in all in the conversion of Russia and then all will love our hearts. So something must happen on some level that's very broad. And the only thing that fills that bill for me is the warning itself. Now there's two aspects of the warning. We know that we will feel it in our hearts through either locution or this like slow motion moving picture where we see this this our life in a chronology that changes everybody's life so profoundly they can't even put it in words for years and don't know how to process it. And they all think they've gone mad to every single person that I've ever spoken of. They think they've gone crazy that this happened to them because they because the more they talked about it early on, the more people thought they were nuts. And, and then it, it, they then they could make, moderate that talk. But don't forget the warnings, whatever happens, is also seen. People forget that. It's seen and felt. So in, in the Blessed Mother said, what will be seen at, the, at that time and the time of the miracle has never been seen ever in the world before. It will be the greatest miracle Jesus has ever worked for the world. Doesn't say since creation, like many people distort it, that Jesus ever worked for the world. And they will be able to see and feel it. And science will not explain it. You can see it, televise it, but not touch it. Now, now regarding the warning, though, isn't there something specific that says that... Um, that points to everybody will be aware that everybody has experienced it versus some, some just private thing experienced within people after it are wondering like, did I, am I the only one who just went through this? There will be something that will take place in the heavens, like in the sky that will sort of inaugurate the experience that then becomes interior in light of that. I think St. Saint Faustina describes it, and I, I believe, as seeing our Lord on the cross and, and light coming from his wounds. Is there something similar to that that has been said regarding, I think it was from Conchita talking about um, something will take place, like a collision perhaps in, in, uh, in the heavens? Well, and well, well, she said it would be like, now mind you, she's 12, 13, 14-year-old girl. <laughs> it would be like two stars colliding. And, it, and whatever it is, it begins with an A. Now, I have material in the book on that, and it's even on the back cover. What is it begins with A? So I have some things than that, and I don't, I don't think it's really that strong, but I just present some data that's out there that could be, but I don't make a prediction on it. But it's like two stars colliding. It, at first, I thought like, you know, like an asteroid. And frankly, I know what a comet is as a ball of ice and matter flowing through. And comets have a way by the time they get to Earth of fizzling out. And there's this comet coming to Earth and it's going to be most visible in the sky. If you're ready for this, October 13th, 2024. And it was found by the Chinese. Now, how far away is this comet? 44 million miles <laughs> and but they have a way of fizzling out as this ball of ice so you know i make the point of saying it it, it possibly is but the, it, it's 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 called atlas mm -hmm. it begins with an a so the chinese have actually named it with a chinese name that's interesting i i mentioned this question we didn't get into it because uh he he wasn't aware of it and i and i've only known some of it um, in light of these celestial events, this, this is very common, even the biblical times, even the time of, of the nativity of our Lord, there have been corresponding things, signs in the skies. And I always tell others, like, don't be dismissive. Before this world of technology, civilizations always looked for revelation of God and, and communication from God in some, some way by understanding the stars because they saw a wisdom behind everything that took place. And um, even before, I didn't even know this, but be, right before Our Lady appeared in uh, Mexico City in 1531, there was a comet that was pretty prominent around that time. There was earthquakes the year before. There was like three major ones. They just knew something was going on. Um, and so, um, and in, in classic Catholic prophecy, you, know, you probably have the little book 
called Catholic Prophecy by Eve Dupont. It has the comment on the front. Little, it's got the little pink cover. Yeah, yeah it's got it's the comment on the front. But since the early earliest centuries, saints have seen that there's going to be some, there's things that, that will happen on a massive scale at the turning of the world and changing of what we're going through is going to correspond with these celestial <clears throat> events. And so not and so to really like, like Genesis says God gave us these things for times and for seasons <clears throat> to know the times and the seasons. Um and so and and reason I mentioned that is because um there's another I hadn't heard of Atlas until you had mentioned that. And of course that date is very interesting. Um there's another one that's being that has been talked about and I think is going to be talked about more as we get into 2025. It's it's it's, it's a major asteroid that's going to be going closest to Earth than we've ever had one before. And that's like in 2029, I think it is. And it's called Apophis or Apophis. It's a really an Egypt word. But it's uh, it refers to, I forget the translation. I, I looked it up and it had to do something along the lines of like a serpent once again. It was like something apocalyptic term because it had to do with an Egyptian god. And, um, and how... The reason that what I had learned about that had a lot of it to do with the um, how that could be used by those who know of it to once again curtail <clears throat> the world into a state of fear and all of that and try to you know coerce them into well, I don't know whatever kind of situation they want. But anyway, it is interesting. That was the only other one that I knew of, but um, I know that there that was a big thing, something about in the sky. And then also a big ecclesial ecclesial event is supposed to be corresponding to. I be, is it the warning or the miracle where there's a the miracle? Okay. Well, so. well let let let's do the deep dive into the miracle. Let's this do that. Is, right is right if nobody is right. Wrong is wrong if everybody is wrong. And believe me, in this error-infested world. What we really need is a church and an authority that is right not when the world is right, but one that is right when the world is wrong. Never in history has the prayer of the rosary been more needed to save our families, our countries, and defeat the evils of the world than now. The Fulton Sheen Institute worked closely with Aroma Rosary to develop the most unique, beautiful, and meaningful rosary that was inspired by Fulton Sheen's World Mission Rosary. This special handcrafted rosary continues Sheen's passion to support the mission of the church to evangelize the entire world. Each decade of the rosary has a different color, which corresponds with a different continent. Yellow for Asia, red for the Americas, white for Europe, blue for the nations of Oceania, and green for Africa. Each Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary comes with a set of four pure essential oil blends that have been chosen for their therapeutic and theological significance. These blends correspond to the four mysteries of the rosary. Simply choose the oil for the mystery of the day, drop a small drop in the palm of your hand, and massage the oil over the surface, being sure to catch the lava beads. You're good to go, and your prayer will linger longer with these beautiful, aromatic notes. Every Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary you purchase supports our mission to fight the battle for the hearts and souls of the Christian family and lead our world back to God. So visit the Fulton Sheen Institute's store and pick up your beautiful Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary today. Get one for you, your family members, and your close friends, and don't forget your pastor. Thank you so much for your prayers and your support.